Good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Buy Now, Sell Now. My name is Alex Matthew. With me is Cheryl D'Souza and we'll take you through the next one hour or so of trade. It's looking good for the equity markets uh, this morning and that uh, has been the case over the last couple of days. In fact, we're looking stronger today than we did yesterday with gains of about half a percent uh, for the benchmark indices for the most part. Uh, just now, the Nifty 50 trading about four tenths of a percent higher uh, at uh, approximately uh, 15,257 or thereabouts. So, holding comfortably above that 15,200 mark uh, as we speak. In fact, within sniffing distance of the all time high, which is, as you know, 15,400 uh, or thereabouts, 15,431. Uh, now, what are the factors that are playing a part today? Of course, COVID-19 infections falling is a big positive and I think that has given a sentimental boost. First time in several uh, days, in fact, since the 8th of April, that India has reported less than 2 lakh cases on a daily basis. And the fact that a few states are talking about when and how they can start the unlocking of the economy. All of that is playing a part. Uh, let me very quickly take you through what the sectors are looking like. Uh, you have only the financial names that are underperforming in trade today. The Nifty Bank down about 7 tenths of a percent. But all of the other sectoral indices are actually gaining at this point. But the metals uh, at the forefront once again after losing just a little bit of ground uh, in yesterday's session. Up over 2% in trade. Cheryl, good morning to you. And what are the stocks that you're looking at? Good morning, Alex. A couple of stocks uh, that are buzzing in today's trading session. You have uh, Navneet Education that is uh, buzzing because the company's board will be meeting on May 27th to consider a proposal for share buyback. Apart from that, you have Mahanagar Gas that is buzzing on back of strong earnings. Along with that, you have also JK Paper that is reacting to their earnings. Barbecue Nation, strong set of numbers coming in for that particular counter, up over 5% in trade. HOEC is under pressure. They said the cyclone... Uh, 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 Cyclone Taute and the onset of uh, monsoon delays of the installation work at a V80 field and due to that they see that the first oil from the field will be delayed right up till the third quarter of FY22. So that is one of the reasons why HOEC is under pressure in today's trading session. Apart from that you have Thermax and Imami that's on focus because they will be reporting their earnings today. And you have IG Petro that is also moving on back office earning. Amar Raja has seen 10% equity block deal, so that stock is also under pressure. And HDFC Bank is also in focus today. But one stock that has been focused over the past few days is United Spirits, and that is on back of its earnings. My colleague Mubina is here uh, with some interesting uh, uh, management interaction lined up for us. Good morning, uh, Mubina, and take it away. Thanks, Cheryl, and hi. Good morning to all of our viewers as well. Yes, United Spirits, the stock price continues to go higher today as well in trade. Fourth quarter numbers definitely did get the streets saying cheers to the company. In fact, let's take forward uh, all that happened in Q4 and what can we expect going forward in the brand new fiscal year as well. We have with us a very special guest, Anand Kripalu. He's the MD and CEO of Diageo India. Mr. Kripalu, really appreciate you taking out time and joining us today on the show. Thanks so much. Um, to start with, Mr. Kripalu, I must ask you about the massive uh, growth seen in the top line. Um, very impressive indeed. I mean, you know, in the corresponding quarter, you of course did have that one-off, um, you know, bulk sale of the Scotch inventory. Despite that, your top line has grown 12%. The PNA segment revenue volumes have grown in a great manner. Now, again, uh, the uh, the question that uh, uh, you know arises over here is that the base quarter was a little weakish, um, you know, despite that one-off sale. Uh, so. How much of this, uh, you know, superb double-digit growth has actually been on account of, you know, maybe a, a, a low base? And, and what sort of inherent recovery in demand you saw in Q4? Sure. First of all, thank you for uh, having me on the program. It's a, a pleasure to join you and talk about our company. So, you know, I'm particularly pleased with our last quarter's numbers. Uh, they were very, very strong. Uh, as you said, yes, we were lapping a somewhat soft quarter. If I remove the bulk squat sales and the fact that there was a kind of national lockdown for about a week uh, towards the end of the, the base quarter that we're talking of. Despite that, um, I'm very pleased with our numbers, uh, both on revenue, margin, as well as cash. Now, I think the thing about our industry and our category 
is, um, and that's what's demonstrated in this quarter, is its resilience. This quarter, pretty much everything was open, right? Retail was open, bars were open, albeit with uh, low footfalls. And of course, the big weddings and banquets didn't happen. But that was substituted with a lot of, I would say, small social uh, gatherings in home. But this just tells you the consumer stickiness of this category and its resilience. And I believe it demonstrates that, you know, when you have peace times, um, when the waters are calm, um, the ability to grow double digit is absolutely something that this business can do consistently. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Kripal, you know, my next question is going to be uh, taking forward from what we saw in that last week of March, the second wave, which led to localized lockdowns. Once again, bars, restaurants, even in that limited capacity that they were operating at, had to be now completely shut down. What's been the impact that you have seen so far? And do you think that the off-trade channels, uh, you know, given the experience that we've seen in the last one year, have strengthened enough to be able to compensate for the loss of revenues coming in, you know, on account of uh, the shutdown of the Horeca segment? Well, so it's like this now. Um, you know, we've been through that first wave. We learned a few things because none of us had dealt with a crisis of this magnitude in our careers, I would say. We've seen sales going up and down, but we had never seen zero sales that we had for uh, five or six weeks of the national lockdown, uh, you know, and when you're sitting with large overheads, that's a big challenge. And um, as things had started improving, we've obviously seen in now the few recent weeks uh, some challenges again. So the question is, what do you do? First is you focus on what you can do, right? Forget your circle of concern for a moment. Focus on what you can do. And we took a decision that whatever happens, we will emerge stronger from this crisis. And I absolutely want to call out the significant contributions that we have made towards COVID relief, right? Totaling up to getting close to about 130 crores during this period as a corporate between the Agio PLC and locally uh, in support of the communities within which we operate. And I'm really proud about the fact that we did that. So emerging stronger in terms of our corporate reputation and also emerging stronger competitively. And I'd like to believe that each quarter in the last fiscal, we have performed competitively, which means we have outperformed our competitors. Now, the way it's going now, the off-trade does compensate for a good part of the on-trade because, because, you know, the socializing that happens in the pubs and bars and restaurants tends to start happening at home. And, uh, you know, the silver lining is that people have discovered that it is um, actually cheaper to drink at home. You can even drink better, right? And we are finding that. But it doesn't ever fully compensate Right? The on-trade is somewhere between 20 and 25% of our business, and it never fully compensates for those big Indian weddings or those big celebrations and banquets, which are large consumption occasions. But I would say that um, what we have seen is that um, a good part of it does get compensated. And because of the value of trading that we're seeing with um, uh, really the strongest growth in our portfolio coming from Scotch whiskey, and within that, are bottled in origin scotches like uh, Johnny Walker and so on, right? In value terms, I think it tends to start compensating to a large extent. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask you about the margins because, um, you know, that's as well, I think, pleasantly surprised the street quite significantly. Uh, there's been a better product mix for sure because your PNA segment has grown very well. But you've mentioned benign commodity costs as well. Um, you know, at a time when we are seeing inflation across the spectrum of commodities, do you still see that be the case, uh, you know, in April, in May? Do you see any sort of, um, you know, increase in costs? whether it's in, in some of your raw materials or even in packaging for that matter? So uh, you're absolutely uh, right. Um, uh, commodities have been largely benign, I would say, over the last year, and that's obviously helped. And we have combined that with aggressive management-led productivity to ensure that um, you're able to save, extract costs, and that has helped our uh, margin performance as well. Now, 
this current quarter commodities seem okay for now. But having said that, commodities in general in our industry, if you go back, you know, over a long period of time, tends to be four-ish percent, right, on uh, on aggregate. And the biggest commodities for us are really extra neutral alcohol and glass. And um, you know, so I think we've got to expect that there will be some level of inflation that will come in after a benign year. And um, but we will keep, of course, focusing on what we can do, which is management-led productivity, to cushion and neutralize um, at least half of the inflation, if not more. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you saw in West Bengal, in Andhra Pradesh as well, because I think um, those states, you did see slower revenue growth. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why your popular segment uh, showed a bit of a decline in growth in, in volume terms. Um, you know, how long do you think... Pain Sorry, I'm, I think I've lost you. Hello? Right. Um Mr. Kripalu, uh, Mubina is having a patchy line. This is Cheryl also joining in. And I believe what uh, Mubina would also want to ask you about is that uh, what actually hit the sales volume in the regular segment uh, in Andhra Pradesh and West Bengal? What were the problems that actually, uh, that, uh, what are the problems that you're actually facing in these slow moving markets? Yeah, so uh, the, the two different situations really. West Bengal, um, we saw adverse regulatory decisions where the selling price for our brands went up discontinuously. So there were two big uh, jumps to consumer price. The first was the COVID tax, which most other states have now negated and rolled back. West Bengal did not do that. And on top of that, they had a new excise policy, which further added taxes and therefore made many of our brands really far less affordable than they were earlier. And um, that is what impacted um, not just our popular brands, so to speak, but actually even our prestige and above brands in the state of West Bengal. As far as Andhra is concerned, we've had a challenge over the last year where we aren't able to do business in the state of Andhra Pradesh because they have a route to market model there where we are not able to do business uh, as per the rules with which we do business. So that's the real challenge that we have in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, we're obviously engaging with the government to see what best we can do um, to re-enter the market. But pretty much our sales in Andhra Pradesh um, have come down to next to nothing. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Kripalu, I wanted to ask you about your debt. Uh, another pleasant surprise of there. You managed a, a massive debt reduction drive and that too in a tough year fy21 was undoubtedly i think one of the toughest years you've seen in a very long time like you mentioned in most of uh, you know your very long career so uh, how exactly did that come about what helped you in this debt reduction and what's the plan on deleveraging in fy22 or do you think you're comfortable with this debt level now so I'm absolutely delighted with our cash performance uh, and the levels to which our debt are now. I mean, we started this journey when I came, um, soon after I joined, the debt levels were over 8,000 crores, right? And now we are just over 500 crores. So it's been an enormous journey and it's not just about one quarter, it's about how we have driven the importance of cash in our business, uh, monetizing a large number of um, non-productive assets, which we have done, and then driving efficiency between uh, stock levels and receivables, and also working with state governments to change the amount of excise duty that you have to pay in advance. So a combination of all of this um, has really brought us down to these, um, I would say, uh, very, very good levels uh, in terms of debt and cash. 
looking ahead to your question, um, I think there is scope for some improvement, but I think now it will be more about continuous improvement rather than discontinuous improvement. We still have some um, non-core assets to sell, uh, and that's going to help us, and we will continue uh, improving working capital uh, and improving that just in terms of management productivity. All right, so with some more non-core assets to sell, I suppose we can look forward to some more uh, debt reduction and, and better cash flow as well. Uh, Mr. Kripalu, we leave it at that. Uh, once again, really appreciate you taking our time from your busy schedule and speaking with us on ET Now, and congratulations on a great uh, quarter for United Spirits. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, uh, United Spirits, like I mentioned, continues to gain today in trade as well. Remember, most brokerage house, houses as well have given a thumbs up to this one post their Q4 performance. Well, with that, uh, we'll take a very short break on the show, but Alex and Cheryl will be back with Buy Now, Sell Now. Welcome back. Uh, you're watching Buy Now, Sell Now on ET Now. We had the management of United Spirits uh, talk to us just a short while back. That was an interesting conversation. The stock is up and about in trade today. But it's time for us to take you to our viewer query segment. And let me introduce our guests for today. We've got Kunal Bothra and we've also got Saurabh Jain, who is associate, or sorry, Assistant Vice President uh, Research at SMC Global Securities. Welcome to the both of you. I, I want to start uh, with a view on Schaeffler India. And this is a question from Sagar. Uh, he says, you know, it is clearly an MNC company, a strong player in the auto ancillary space. He bought 35 shares at uh, levels of 4,900 and looking at uh, levels of 5,500 to 6,000 targets. Kunal, is that a possibility? It seems to be. Good morning, Alex, first of all. Uh, I think it's a stock which is... Uh, you know, which which moves in very strong periods of uh, you know, uptrend. We've seen the stock doing pretty well for itself over the much uh, in longer term. So, short term charts, I'm not too sure uh, because the stock seems to be uh, more or less in a consolidation with 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 possibility for mild breakout. Uh, but I think on the longer term prospect, yes, the stock looks fairly attractive. So, if the viewer has a longer term kind of a time frame, then I would suggest a hold on uh, you know Shifter India. All right, our next query is a Twitter query that we've got from Himanshu and he wants to, he's looking at a short term, he wants to know will it be a prudent decision to purchase Abbott India at current price or should he wait for some more correction? Uh, what's your take on this one, Kunal? Good morning to you and also good morning to Saurabh. Good morning, Cheryl. So uh, I think on Abbott India, yes, it's heading towards a short term breakout. Uh, so on technical terms, it's forming a bullish flag kind of a formation. The breakout is uh, at 16,100, 16,150 zone. And the stock is just marginally above that breakout point. So technically, we'll, we, we can probably call this as a breakout for Abbott India. Uh, and I think the targets for this could be approximately 1,000 to 1,200 rupees from current level. So 17,200 to 17,500 is where we place the short term target range for the stock. All right, we've got Radesh on uh, YouTube asking a question on Tata Powers. And I I'm going to come to you on this one, Saurabh. Uh, I can't remember if I said good morning, so I'm going to say it again. Good morning to you. Would you buy Tata Motors for a period of five years? Hi, good oh, morning. Sorry, Tata Power. Yeah. Let me amend I mean, that. Tata, Tata Power, Power for, <laughs> for, a, for a period of five years. Yeah, the, the company has done good amount of restructuring. If you see the debt levels, they have uh, reduced the debt approximately 9,000 crore of about 9,000 crore. They are they are doing uh, wonderfully. I, I think they are also planning to come with an IPO of the renewable on the renewable side also. So the company has uh, has uh, you know. Uh, resolved many of the issues which were there and now i think uh, the the story looks much more promising and if you look at the uh, stock also the stock has outperformed the uh, both the energy basket and the broader indices also so my take would be hold on to it for long term The next query is coming in from Rajendra Gandhi on YouTube saying that he wants to know the short term targets for HEG. Uh, uh, what sort of targets uh, should one look at for HEG Kunal over the shorter term? How is the charts looking for this particular counter? We tend to see uh, uh, like a, you know, extreme moves come in HEG as well as in Graphite India together at a time. So what sort of targets should one keep in mind if they want to invest over the shorter term in HEG? 
so yeah both these stocks look attractive hg graphite they move in sync with each other uh, you know there was a big breakout for hg i think on the monthly charts as well last month when stock had moved up from 1500 to 2500 plus kind of a territory somehow the stock has just about gone through more sideways price action uh, you know for a good part of this month but it's trying to pick up pace yet again so the breakout point which i believe from a short term charts for hg would be at 2580 levels which is approximately around uh, you know 4% to 4.5% from current level so if the stock scales past about 2580 mark is where i believe that uh, you know the 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 room for upside opens up significantly higher so you know uh, uh, maybe an upside of almost 500 to 750 points further from those levels could be seen to the stock so you have to take it step by step short term wise look at 2580 as the first hurdle point if that gets taken out then you can uh, you know extend the time or uh, the targets to almost 500 to 7 points further on the upside from those levels Okay, this is an interesting question coming in from Raghu on uh, YouTube. He's holding 670 uh, shares of ONGC at an average cost of 155. He's wondering if he can liquidate and buy uh, PI Industries, uh, and he, he's he's looking for an entry price for PI Industries. But I'm going to come across to you, uh, Sora, because he's looking at either PI Industries or another stock for the next 10 years. So it needs to be something that is strong fundamentally. I think if you look at the the way the crude prices are trending, surely it looks promising for the oil exploration company, especially when the ONGC is also owning HPCL, the downstream companies, the companies which and uh, those company uh, that company has also reported good numbers. I think it is the PSU kind of overhang, and also the uh, there has been less confidence because of the uh, general uh, selling by the government of India. The, uh, 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 by and large, uh, you know, every year they come out with the uh, uh, offer for sale, or maybe the huge dividend the company has to pay out. But I, I think uh, surely this time around the PSU will perform. I think uh, the way the crude prices are uh, trending, ONGC can uh, can perform well, and uh, uh, and uh, your price uh, seems to be. Uh, you can see your price in this year, uh, this year also. And in case you wish to convert your holding into some other stock, I would recommending the. value play which is playing out globally in uh, in indian context i think the psu banking side i think you can play uh, that value gap uh, very well and uh, i will recommend to you uh, to bet upon uh, banks like sbi or maybe indian all right the next query is coming in uh, from abhishek bandari and this he uh, wants to know whether he can buy nbcc at current levels he wants to know what sort of target should he actually look at abhishek has not mentioned whether he is a short term or long term target but nevertheless uh, saurabh i'll come to you with this uh, query good morning what's your view coming in on nbcc makes sense to invest at current levels and what sort of uh, targets are you eyeing for nbcc i think it is a good company but uh, and having a good order book but the thing is that the company enjoys very thin margin i mean uh, they, they they work on a very very thin margin so uh, only only that aspects i do not like i would recommend rather if you want to bet upon this sector i think the on the construction side maybe ncc or maybe kkn or construction or, or per se in the reality sector companies like brigade enterprises makes good sense to invest in for a year or Okay, uh, Rajan uh, Vital has uh, asked a question on Marico Kunal, and uh, he's got 150 shares at levels of 460. If I'm not mistaken, that is more or less where the stock is at right now. It's had quite a decent run uh, uh, over the last one year or so, uh, gaining about 50% or thereabouts. How do you see it going in the short term, though? Because Rajan's got a short term uh, target or short term holding period. Should he hold or exit at this point? I think you should hold. Uh, I would advise the viewer to hold on to the investments. It's just off late. I think uh, a week or two back, if I'm not wrong, that Marico has managed to come back to uh, you know momentum. So the stock was lying absolutely listless and sideways for the past three four months, and uh, I think it's just about this month that the stock has managed to come back into uh, you know a breakout kind of a zone. So it looks very attractive on the charts. Uh, you've bought at current market price. You know these are the kind of stocks which warrants uh, you know. Uh, Uh, a good enough bandwidth in terms of time frame for these stocks to perform so you can't expect that these stocks will move up very similar to a high beta pocket or high beta 
sector so these stocks they move up in their own tangent but when they these stocks they tend to provide a breakout they tend to be more structural breakout for these names so i would sense that uh, you know you should hold on to marico and probably extend your time horizon from short term to uh, you know medium term to at least long term Right. Our next query is coming in from Pavan Kumar, and this one is for you, Kunal. He is asking, Will Canara Bank bounce after today's fall? He is. He has a June two thirty call option, which has fallen fifty fifty percent from his purchasing price. So, what's your view coming in on Canara Bank June two thirty call? I think June two thirty call would probably be, uh, you know, a, a bit of a far, you know, far cry for a stock like Canara Bank. Uh, you know, it's been hovering around this 150 to 165, 170 mark for quite some time. I think this is the fourth month, if I'm not wrong, that the stock is hovering very close to this 155 pivot point, plus or minus 15, 20 rupees from those levels. Ideally, when you are looking at buying such deep out of the money, uh, you know, uh, call options, you have to wait for the stocks to give some sort of a breakout point. You can't buy the stocks uh, in, at an equilibrium zone and expect that these stocks will give a breakout on the upside. So I would suggest that uh, you know a much more prudent strategy could have been uh, had the stock broken past about that 175 mark, that could have led to a strong breakout for a stock like Canara Bank, and then buying probably the deep out of the money call options could be a better strategy. Okay, uh, Saurabh, you mentioned that you're positive on public sector banks, and you mentioned SBI. So I'm going to take this opportunity to. Kind of tweak uh, Shrinivas's question. Shrinivas has asked, which sector would you focus on over the next few months? Uh, I'm guessing that that would be the banking space, and you would like to speak about PSU banks. The question really is, with State Bank of India having gained about 22% over the last month, has it already uh, breached that gap that it had with the large private sector banks? It is still undervalued in comparison. Some would argue significantly undervalued. Uh, do you think that it has a lot more headroom to grow? I mean, surely, if you look at, if you uh, make a comparison, there was always there was always a discount uh, uh, of uh, you know the valuation at which PSU banks trade uh, in comparison to the HDFC bank because of the uh, huge uh, you know uh, NPA problems and the lending to the uh, uh, priority sector lending and what's not. And um, this time around, I think the all the legacy issues have been settled by the all the PSU bank in the last five seven years. If you if you see, they have they have uh, done a whole lot of provisions, and the net NPAs are now very much at comfortable level. In case of SBI, I think the provision coverage ratio now has been 86 87 percent, and the credit cost has decla declined significantly. So I am expecting that uh, after doing so much exercise, uh, and uh, and the numbers are now actually in in. Uh, at par with that of uh, good private sector bank, I think the valuation gap has to reduce. And uh, for that matter only, uh, I would recommend that it is a good value play. And I expect that the valuation catch up will soon be uh, visible uh, on, on the on the markets and uh, you will fetch good returns if you invest in the PSU bank. Uh, he's saying that he's bought New India Assurance at 166 rupees per share. He wants to know what's the technical view on charts and what sort of target can one look at for this week for New India Assurance? Uh, Kunal, what's your take coming in for New India Assurance? Oh, uh, it looks attractive. I think on the short term charts, it's just heading towards a breakout. I think if I'm not wrong, 165 to 170 is the breakout range for the stock. It's up around uh, you know one percent approximately on an intraday basis, but I think it's better to wait for a breakout about that 165, 170 zone. That breakout potential could be almost a 20 rupee breakout on the upside. So if that breakout is successful about this 165, 170 zone, then probably you can uh, expect the stock to come back to its three month, four month highs, which was around 190 plus level. So I would suggest a buy, but uh, specifically if the stock gives that breakout of the range which I mentioned. All right, Saurabh, coming to you on this next one. Uh, Neeraj has bought Granules India for uh, 360 rupees per share. He's bought 800 shares. And he's he says that he can hold for at least three years. Uh, and he's looking for a long-term target. What, according to you, would be that target? And should he hold this uh, investment? 
granular story is looking very much good i think if you look at the last quarterly numbers they have uh, announced very good numbers the only problem that the stock did not uh, play out well on the bursis is because of the you know uh, it, it is largely dependent on the paracetamol and the and the uh, raw material cost is going up but still the company has guided good double digit growth uh, for the next few years and i think it makes all the more sense to stick with the stock for the next few years so i would suggest to hold on it All right. The next query is coming in from Ritesh. He's saying that he's bought a PVR June 1300 call option after the unlocking news at 67.5 rupees per share. Uh, uh, he he wants to know is the stock in a bullish uh, trend? Uh, Kunal, what's your take coming in on PVR June 1300 call? Definitely one of the new uh, one of the news peg would be the unlocking uh, that is likely to be taking place in various states. Various states have hinted also at that. So how does PVR look like? See, I think this is a better trade. So, uh, uh, you know, for the option, uh, you know, buyers specifically who tend to buy the uh, you know options and they look at deep, very deep out of the money strikes. I think this is a much more better strategy for for someone who's uh, you know wanting to you know trade options. So, PVR on the chart specifically has given a breakout about twelve, uh, you know, twenty five, twelve fifty zone. This was a bit of a resistance for the stock. Uh, a cup and handle kind of a breakout uh, you know, on the charts on the daily time frame, and he's bought slightly uh, you know out of the money, which is. A 1300 strike as as compared to a current level of 1265, 1268. Uh, also, I think if the breakout is successful, the stock would also confirm a breakout of a 200 moving average. So there could be a double uh, you know breakout edge for a stock like PVR, which is why I think it makes sense to hold on to this trade. I would suggest that uh, you know keep a stop loss of uh, approximately 1250, 1245. That should be a good support for PVR. So. you can uh, you know calculate the option price accordingly i think if that support holds on there is a possibility that pvr can rise substantially over the next uh, you know few weeks and uh, on the fundamentals don't uh, forget that you could uh, at least not maybe not in june but you could be hearing uh, news of an unlock over the course of the next few months that is the word that we currently have from a few governments all right uh, now swaminathan sundareshan is asking about kaplan point laboratories uh, and he's looking at a medium term outlook uh, i don't think uh, saurabh that he's bought into this counter yet would you suggest that he should uh, i don't have idea about this company but in general i think the it is good to stick with the uh, big companies in the pharmaceutical sector for example the companies like netco pharma All right. The next query is coming from Shanti uh, on Amara Raja Batteries. Uh, wants to know about the stock. Wants to know how to look at this uh, bulk uh, sale of 10%. Uh, does this actually uh, should one treat this as the weakness of business credentials coming forward? And also, Shanti wants to know whether should uh, one stay put with Amara Raja Batteries or switch to Excite Industries? Or what's your take on Amara Raja Batteries? Does this bulk sale have to do anything with the uh, Uh, uh like i uh, have to do anything with the business uh, performance of this company i think it is a significant amount of sale which has come uh, from the promoter of the company that too has uh, that too at a, a good amount of discount from the yesterday close so i would take it as as a bit negative and i wouldn't recommend to stay invested stay put in the battery sector i mean uh, i would not recommend to switch over the Uh, on the X side, uh, but rather I would recommend to change out, change the sector and uh, uh, bet on the real estate or maybe bank. Okay, uh, definitely a red flag to pay attention to. We've got uh, Sandhya. No, sorry, uh, apology. We've got Shanmuga Sundaram, who's bought uh, HDFC Bank at levels of one thousand four hundred and fifty-five. Uh, Kunal, we were actually just debating this. Uh, in fact, uh, Nikunj was debating this in the morning. and talking about the fact that it has been a rank underperformer if you look at the large pra- uh, private sector banks over the past several months uh, would you hold on to this for the next 6 months though can you repeat the name of the stock alex i missed it uh, i think there was some audio issue wait to- wait we're talking about hdfc bank and the conversation this morning was how it was lagging its uh, private sector peers Uh, we've got Shanmuga, who's bought at levels of one thousand four hundred and fifty-five. Would you hold on to this trade for six months? Well, I would definitely uh, advise to hold on. I think you know, 
it happens that many of these uh, you know large cap banking names they go through their periods of uh, you know sideways correction a period of underperformance compared to the other peers there are about you know there could be a lot of triggers and reasons for that some of them could be fundamental some of them could be even driven uh, you know for these stocks but then you have to look at the larger scheme of things now whether you are bullish on the uh, entire market if yes then of course uh, you know uh, stfc bank stands to be one of the top contenders uh, you know to give a, a a strong leading breakout in that sense you look at the relative performance uh, you know for the stock not in the last 3 4 months yes in the last 3 4 months there is a, a tad bit of underperformance but you look at it comparatively over the last uh, you know 12 13 months from those march 2020 lows and the stock stands to out to be uh, you know one of the stronger performers from the private sector bank so i would give uh, you know more emphasis towards hdfc bank from a medium term to long term view yes the stock is underperforming in the last 2 3 months but as i said that these are just uh, you know phases which a stock has to go uh, you know go go by and i think once that phase settles out there is this there could be a, a strong bout of uh, you know recovery into this stock as well so extremely bullish on hdfc bank from a medium term to long term view next query is coming in from uh, padma saying that uh, she's bought a chambal fertilizers or uh, 300 shares at 285 rupees per share wants to know whether she should continue to hold on to chambal fertilizers or move to other psu cover fertilizer companies like gsfc or rcf uh, what's your take coming in on chambal fertilizers uh, sort of uh, make sense to stay put in this particular counter or take a switch to other psu fertilizer stocks I think it is a very good company in the fertilizer pack. Uh, the promoter is also increasing its stake in the company, and if you look at the numbers, the company continues to post good set of numbers. And the and the off late uh, recent rally was also driven by the some subsidy news. I think the other stock which is there in the fertilizer pack is the Coromandel International. I think the uh, the it is a chambal fertilizer is a very good stock, but uh, but maybe you have bought a, a bit uh, you know at a higher levels. But uh, but uh, that that would not be a worry in case you stick. With your investment for a longer term horizon, I'm sure you will be rewarded uh, with good gains. Okay, uh, trying to fit in a few more questions. Sort of coming to you on this one. Anjali wants a fundamental view on IFL Securities. Uh, she's currently uh, invested, I believe. If a normal, no, she would like to buy at the current market price of seventy-five. She's uh, looking at the long-term prospects. Would you suggest an investment? I think long-term prospects look promising, uh, considering the way the, uh, the financial services, all the financial services, are making headroom in the uh, in the times of pandemic. The investment, uh, 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 the people have started investing, and uh, new uh, new new account openings, and the and the uh, amount of money which is coming in the uh, sector uh, in the financial services in the equity markets are benefiting these companies. So I, I am positive on the on the outlook. Uh, she uh, she can go and uh, invest some money. This query is coming in from Sherry, uh, saying that she's holding um, Tata Motors June 400 call option for a week now. Bought it when Tata Motors share was trading at 350 rupees per share. Is losing 66% of her wealth. Uh, wants to know should uh, should she average it or shift to 340 call or leave trading in uh, June 400 call. What's your take coming in on this, Kunal? Tata Motors June 400 call. I think 400, uh, you know, strike seems to be as I said earlier that it seems to be a a very deep out of the money strikes and you know these deep out of the money strikes when you have so much of time left and the stock remains sideways they will tend to erode uh, or you know give away a lot of your premium. So I think the the majority of the reason why you are losing on the trade is probably by uh, you know selection of the wrong strike into uh, you know the stock. So it it looks attractive on the charts. Auto stocks are going through a breakout. There was some I think negative news flow. Uh, surrounding Tata Motors, couple of weeks back, I think if I'm not wrong regarding results, etc. But I think the stock seems to have digested those kind of negative news flow. I would suggest wait for a breakout about 325 for Tata Motors. If that happens, then probably a 350 call uh, uh, or a 340 call out of the money for uh, Tata Motors on June series, I think could be a good bet from a trading perspective. Now, uh, before the program started, we actually asked uh, our experts Kunal as well as Sorab to share their high risk and low risk ideas with us. I want to start with Sorab's high risk and low risk ideas. In fact, uh, he's got two low risk ideas. He's already spoken to you about SBI, and he says that you can buy it with a target of 490. 
He's uh, uh, spoken about why he thinks SBI is a good bet. Uh, but I, I want to take you through the next idea, which is Brigade Enterprises. He says that you should buy for a target of 320. Uh, and he points out that uh, the business is actually looking uh, uh, to gain momentum. Uh, it's got all-time high uh, yearly sales of 4.6 million square foot with a total value of 2,767 uh, crore rupees and a strong pipeline, which will help the company uh, maintain momentum going forward. Uh, the average debt, co uh, debt cost is also at an all-time low of 8.4%. Kunal's high-risk and low-risk ideas, uh, a, a couple of uh, buy calls, a buy call on Delta Corp with a target of 200 and a stop loss of 165. This is a high-risk idea. And, and, and a buy call on MMTC with a target of 65 and a stop loss of 50 rupees. And this is also a high-risk idea. On that note, I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking the time and for taking our viewers through all of uh, the queries that they answered, uh, that you answered for them. It's been a pleasure speaking to you as always. We're slipping into a short break. More on the other side. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Buy Now, Sell Now on ET Now. Time for the BNS and quiz, uh, question as well as the champion. So we asked you uh, which country was the biggest equity gainer among EMs in the year 2020. The options were Malaysia, Taiwan, South Korea and India. And the answer was South Korea. But let's take a look who is the champion. Unfortunately, no one has got this answer correct. But no problem. You can uh, try out uh, your luck tomorrow when we ask you a new BNSN quiz question. All right, and moving on uh, to an ET Now Insight. Uh, broader markets resilience has been one of the key emerging trends uh, since the pandemic hit us uh, last year. On ET Now Insight, here's Jayesh with a comprehensive analysis on the performance of the small cap and mid cap funds this year and over the last three years. There has been significant outperformance by the broader market space so far this year. However, if you extend the time frame to three years, uh, it looks like a catch up trade for both the small and the mid cap indices. Uh, uh, given this fact, uh, let's also analyze how the funds have actually performed from the mid and the small cap space. Uh, talking about the mid cap fund performance, there are only 23% funds that have outperformed their benchmark index since the start of 2021. While on the flip side, you have 77% funds which have underperformed their benchmark. And on a three-year basis, uh, there are 59% funds that have outperformed, while 41% funds have underperformed their benchmark. Uh, uh, talking about individual funds which have outperformed on a YTD basis and how they shape up in the three-year time frame, let's have a look at that. You have the top fund, which is uh, Nippon India Growth Fund, along with uh, popular names like the Franklin India Primer Fund and the Edelweiss Midcap Fund as well which have outperformed their benchmark so far uh, on a YTD basis. Uh, all of them have also managed to outperform on a three-year basis except for the Franklin India Primer Fund. Uh, talking about the underperformers, you have the likes of DSP Midcap Fund, the IDBI Midcap Fund, Motilal Oswal uh, Midcap 30 Fund along with the UTI Thematic Midcap Fund and the LNT Midcap Fund as well which have uh, underperformed their benchmark uh, with a range of about 6 to 8 percent each. Uh, Two of them or three of them have in fact managed to underperform on a three-year basis, which is the IDBI Midcap Fund, uh, the Motilal Oswal Fund, as well as the LNT Midcap Fund. Similar is the picture for the small cap space as well, where 48% uh, funds have uh, outperformed uh, on a YTD basis, while 52% have underperformed on a YTD basis, and uh, exactly the reverse on a three-year time frame. Uh, so which are the funds that have outperformed their benchmarks? Uh, you have the Kotak Small Cap Fund along with the Nippon India Small Cap Fund that have outperformed both on a YTD and on a three-year basis as well. Talking about the underperformers, lastly, you have a whole host of names ranging from SBI Small Cap Fund, HSBC Small Cap Fund, the DSV Small Cap Fund, Sundaram Small Cap Fund and the IDBI Small Cap Fund which have underperformed their benchmark in the range of about 2 to 6 6% uh, 6 and two of them have uh, underperformed significantly on a 3 year basis which is the HSBC small cap fund along with the Sundaram small cap fund All right. Now, uh, there was an interesting update uh, with regard to HDFC Bank. There was a con call that was uh, uh, held 
uh, and uh, with, uh, in fact, the brokerages. And, and there were quite a few points that were discussed. Poonam is here to take you through some of the salient features of that call. Poonam? Well, Macquarie hosted an investor call with the management of HDFC Bank and management on COVID ways stated that the near-term delinquencies are likely to rise, but the overall losses would be contained. The check bounce rates have normalized in May after rising in April and the impact on the supply chain is not as much versus the first wave. Second wave, of course, has had, has had an impact in terms of the rural areas, but SME and corporate book is holding up well. They expect higher delinquencies in the retail book and especially from the restructured uh, assets as well as uh, from the book that had taken moratorium earlier. But management believes that NPLs will be a timing issue and eventual losses would be low. They are working on war footing to improve the overall technology recovery systems as well as user experience. Audit report has been submitted to the RPI and they are awaiting approval from RPI. They are also on track to implement various deliverables. They are building resilience so that the recovery is faster in an, in an event of an outage and they are also confident that inability to launch credit cards will not impact profits. They've already migrated to a cloud-based architecture. Macquarie, in fact, states that the stock is trading at a 15 to 20% discount to the historical averages, and the bank is uh, still uh, the bank will be still able to capture market share and deliver high profits. And uh, the current levels are a good level to add to the stock. All right, thank you for that, Poonam. But uh, we're joined by my colleague Priyanka Ayer, who's got the latest on the DHFL resolution. Uh, good morning, Priyanka, and tell us what the NCLAT has actually decided on the DHFL resolution. Well, you know, after the NCLT order last week, this is a big win and relief for Piramal Enterprises, for the Committee of Creditors of DHFL, and as well as the RBI-led administrator that was appointed for DHFL. NCLAT has put a stay on the NCLT order that had asked for the Vadavan resolution plan, or rather the settlement proposal given by Kapil Vadavan of around 91,000 crores to be considered. And now NCLAT has said that there should be a stay on it. NCLAT has observed that, you know, the appeal that had come in from Vadavan for this proposal to be considered should not really be an impediment for the NCLT to go ahead and in fact pass an order on Piramal's resolution plan, which was uh, selected by the Committee of Creditors as the winning resolution plan through a due process of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. Uh, in fact, arguments were heard from the COC Council, Tushar Mehta. Uh, Abhishek Manu Singhvi was representing the Pyramid side as well. Uh, there was also the RBI-led Administrator Council, Mr. Ravi Kadam, and the Council for Kapil Vadavan was also present. Well, the, uh, Tushar Mehta argued that, you know, that uh, this entire NCLT order will be with such a wrong precedent, it will destroy IBC. In fact, Abhishek Manu Singhvi also said that the settlement uh, proposal by Vadavan came in much later. This NCLT order will create havoc and should be stayed because otherwise it will set a wrong precedent in the IBC cases in the future. After hearing all these arguments, the NCLAT has stayed the NCLT order. Uh, the COC does not have to take any decision on Vadavan's plan as per NCLT order anymore. But further detailed arguments will also be heard on June 25th. And the NCLAT has said that they will pass a more detailed order. But at this point in time, quite a big relief with NCLT's order being saved, which has come in as quite a big surprise for the lenders, for uh, you know, even the Committee of Creditors, the uh, Pyramid Resolution Plan has also was also in a fix because of that. All of that has been set straight by this NCLAT order. Well, thanks so much for that update, uh, Priyanka. Uh, we'll stay with the story, of course, over the course of the day and bring you more updates. Uh, let's go across to Vinny now. She's joining in on an interesting note by CLSA on Crompton Greaves. Vinny? So Crompton uh, Greaves Consumer Electricals recently came out with their numbers. At first, we're seeing a note coming in from CLSA where they've actually upgraded the stock to an outperformance with a target price of rupees 435 rupees per share. So surely, interesting update coming in over there. Now, what are the key triggers? One, 
uh, CLSC believes that there's, you know, demand recovery is likely to come in from Q2 FY22. And they believe the company is quite well prepared with the strengths and they've learned a lot uh, coming in in the last year as well. So they are well prepared for the situation as well. Overall, uh, they believe the durable uh, segment for the company uh, is doing quite well and has already got a strong footing and that is something which is a positive for the company as well and the growth going forward as well. Now in terms of commentary what they're mentioning the management has actually said that they're confident of gaining market share as well going forward. So that does show that you know how confident the management is in their growth strategy as well and they know that they will be gaining market share. They're confident about gaining that market share that that does keep CLSA uh, on the positive side for the stock as well. And lastly you know CLSA does highlight that yes there could be some inflation uh, settings and inflationary trends which could hurt uh, the margins in the near term that's in the first half of FY22 but post that they are expecting a good performance coming in from the company overall as well so surely they are uh, positive on the stock and upgraded the stock to an outperform for that uh, uh, note coming in on uh, Crompton Greaves consumers all right, and with that, we are out of time on this edition of uh, Buy Now, Sell Now from Alex and myself. Thank you for watching. Uh, stay tuned. Markets Noon coming up next.